Well, good evening, friends and family. Welcome into our Wednesday night Bible study. If you have your Bibles, you would want to be turning to Philippians chapter 3. We'll be looking at verses 12 down through verse 13, thinking about the topic of running for the prize. I think there are two basic statements that every growing Christian should be able to make, and hopefully you'll agree with me this evening. And they are these two statements. Number one, we have failed in the past. In other words, that is, we have fallen short of what God's goal is for us in this life. But the second statement is, we're dissatisfied with where we are in our spiritual state. And by that, what we're saying is, we have a desire to become more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We want to show, truly show ourselves living for Him in a Christ-like manner. So whether or not, uh, whether you know it or not, if you get to a place where you think you've arrived spiritually, that means you think you've been perfected, you're going to cease to grow in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the same token, and when you are willing to admit that there are areas in which you need to grow, to me that is a sign of maturity. But in these verses we are given a glimpse into the life of the Apostle Paul. He lets us in on a secret that even he, the great Apostle, had work to do in his life. And he understood that he was not perfect, but he was striving for perfection. And I believe this evening you and I should be able to find some encouragement in these words that he writes. So tonight we want to take a few minutes and join Paul on that quest for spiritual maturity as we think together around the thought, again, of running for the prize. When you look at verse 12, the first part of verse 12 and the first part of uh, verse 13, you will notice what I consider to be Paul's examination. Notice there he says, not that I have already attained or am already perfected in verse 12. And then in verse 13 he says, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. When you look at what Paul is saying, you can think of all the reasons that Paul had to be, could have been, uh, have the attitude of being puffed up, where he could poke his chest out, and then he could brag about his life as a Christian. You know, he was the one who was handpicked to be the apostle to the Gentiles. God used him in recording words that you and I have written uh, for us. He was the one who wrote several books through the inspiration of God. He was one who was a tremendous soul winner and a great preacher of God's word. You see, it seems to me, if you think about Paul, you might say, well, Brother Ray, he had all of his ducks in a row, and he was making the grade for Jesus. You see, but anyone that looks at his life closely will come to the conclusion that he had not arrived, as most people would say, based on what they know about him. However, Paul knew the truth. He had not arrived, but he was still working towards that ultimate goal of perfect Christ-likeness. And he noticed Paul's response to his own life was that of a mark of spiritual maturity. We need to be aware of those who think that they have arrived, those who think they know everything. Yes, we have folks who put us as preachers, they put us on a pedestal thinking that we know everything. But I'm here to tell you there are times when I have to study and dig deep to understand what God's Word is saying. It takes effort to continue to grow as a Christian. If you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and you look at verse 12, notice what Paul writes there to our brethren in Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, he says, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. Or perhaps we need to go by, over to the book of Galatians chapter 6, and look at verse 3. Notice what he says again. He says, For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Paul, what are you saying? You and I, when we think we've reached perfection is when we really need mo the most work. You see, we are not there yet, but our goal is to get to that spiritual perfection one day. In fact, Paul realized that he was not perfect. He was not content to sit back and let that cause him to sit still. He understood that growing and moving forward he needed to move forward. You know, I think about the Apostle Paul. If anyone could have been discouraged while working in the cause of Christ, while working for the church of Jesus, in other words, he, 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 he did not get discouraged. He had all the right to be discouraged. But you and I may know people who get discouraged, who quit, 
who give up on the Lord. You know, right now we're looking at, uh, as, as we begin the process of reassembling as the church in a physical facility, many have made statements about Hebrews chapter 10 and verse uh, 25, where it says not to forsake the assembly. Well, I believe, and I, I truly believe, that we're not forsaking the assembling because we haven't abandoned God. And that's what that ver verse means. When though someone has abandoned God, that's when they began to forsake in a willful way. But Paul, if he, anyone could be discouraged, when you think of all that he went through in his life, the beatings of the Jews, the imprisonments, the shipwrecks, and I could go on and on where he talks about how he was in peril with his own country, with his own family, and so on and so forth. If anybody wanted to be discouraged, it would be Paul. But he tells us in this passage that he's not discouraged and he's not going to give up on God. It's not a matter of when or if we fail. It's a matter of when we fail. And when we fail, we need to let our failures build us up in the Lord instead of dropping out of the race that we're running. So tonight I encourage you, if you've fallen by the wayside, get back up, dust yourself off, and start running again. But notice the second point as we look at this, and this is Paul's exertion. What is Paul going to exert to us and tell us that you and I, that we must do in order to move towards perfection, to continue running in the race. The words that he uses are described by terms of action. What Paul is trying to do is to get use some very descriptive words and descriptive language, if you will, to help us and to describe that Christian race. He makes five great statements beginning in verse 12, the second part of verse 12, the second part of verse 13, and the first part of verse 14. Notice what he says. He says, I press on. Literally meaning to run swiftly in order to catch a person or a thing. It is in reference to a hunter that is pursuing his prey. It has the idea of an individual who's running a, a race to reach the finish line. Whatever the goal is, this is a picture of pursuit. For Paul, it is the hope as he goes at the end of that verse where he says that I may lay hold for, of that for which Christ Jesus also laid hold of me. It is the hope of apprehending or laying, uh, laying something on. So what Paul is telling us is, I am pursuing the goal of laying on all that Jesus laid hold on for me. He realized that his salvation, that God had a plan for him as he was on the road to Damascus. And Paul will not be satisfied until he apprehended that for which he had been apprehended. So I ask you tonight, what are you doing? What are you doing for the Lord who gave you the opportunity for salvation? See, many are stuck on salvation. That is, they're saved and they're baptized into Christ, but that is as far as they go. You see, friend, when you put Christ on in baptism... We need to understand we have a purpose in our life. You see, we need to bow down at his feet. We need to find out why that he offered us salvation. We need to pursue all of his will with our full heart. Let nothing satisfy you but satisfying him. But the second thought here in verse 13, the very first part of the verse, he says, this one thing I do. You know, Paul was a specialist. He was just like some Olympic athlete who trains in one thing, in one event. You see, Paul specialized in that one event. And his one special area was he was reaching for the goal. Notice he says, But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. You see, Paul, he says, I've left my past behind. I left behind the being the one who persecuted, who killed, who, who murdered Christians. I now have become a proclaimer of truth, and I am now the one who is being persecuted. But Paul says, I'm leaving all that behind because I have a great future. You see, a man excels when he specializes. If you want to know the secret to Paul's success, 
It is that Paul had what I would say was a one-track mind. Nothing was as important to him than being pleasing to God. You see, one of the problems with our modern day life, the living as a Christian in this life, many of us can't say this one thing I do. Most of us are pulled and tugged in a thousand different directions. Well, we need to understand something. At the end of this life, there is only one thing that matters, and that is how well we have run the race for God. So I would challenge you tonight, develop that one-track mind as Paul had in pursuing this living for God in your life. You see, if anything that this virus has taught us, it is the simplistic things of life. Those things which are simple, things maybe that we've taken for granted for many years. And so as we deal with this virus that's going around, it should help us focus and develop that one-track mind. But you go on again in verse 13 where he says he reaches forward. And this phrase pictures, this, this phrase pictures a runner in the race as he gets near the finish line, and perhaps you've seen it before, a runner that's getting near to the finish line, they will extend their body forward and strain for the goal. And what Paul is saying is he's reaching with all he has to be sure that he wins the race. Tonight, can you and I honestly say that we're straining to reach the goal? For most who are members of the body of Christ, sadly, the Christian life is hit or miss. You see, that is, we just kind of take it as it comes. If you and I succeed for the Lord, then praise Him. If we happen to stumble and fall, it's, oh well, I'll try to do better tomorrow. And that's our ultimate goal. I strive every day to be a better person today than I was yesterday, and hoping for tomorrow where I can be better than I was even today. You see, Paul wasn't content to just sit around and wait for life to happen. Paul was out there busy making life happen. He was out there reaching for all he could so that he might be before his Father who created him and who offered him salvation. He was trying to reach people with the fullest potential for the glory of God. What a wonderful lesson this is for us. But then in verse 14, notice this next phrase. He says, I press toward the goal. I press toward the mark. And when he uses this term mark, that is referring to the goal that one has in view. In other words, Paul was oblivious to those things which were around him. He was heading for the goal. He wanted to finish strong or finish well. Notice that when he did reach the end of his life, he was able to leave behind a great testimony, a great amount of writing for us that we might run well also. You see in 1st 2nd Timothy chapter 4 verse 6 and verse 7, there at the end of his life where he says, "For I am already, or I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith." <clears throat> Excuse me, this is the goal for us. You see, there is a great need for you and for me <clears throat> to avoid the trap of becoming distracted by the events of this life. There is a mark, there is a goal that we should be striving for in our lives. Picture it this way when you come to a tunnel, you look for the light at the other end of the tunnel. Our goal is to get from one end of the tunnel to where the light exists again. You see, God helps us by helps us keep our eye on the goal. Too many come out of the blocks primed and pumped to run the race, but whether it be a few short months or maybe a few short years, they have become distracted. They've fallen out of the Christian race. I like people who are steady. The Lord wants us to be slow and steady. We're all familiar with the passage or the, the story of the rabbit and the hare, or the hare and the turtle. Which one really is doing it? You see, the rabbit is like many people. They come out gung-ho, fast out of the gate, but they fade at the end. But the turtle, slow and steady, is his pace. 
It may take longer to get to the goal, but he eventually will get there. You see, there are many today who are living for the moment, only for what this life has to offer. You see, you and I must not live for the moment in this world, but we must run with endurance the race that is set before us with eternity in view at all time. Let us realize that God is honored by a race that is run and a life that is well lived. Not easily distracted, but we focus and keep our eyes on the goal. But then you come to the last part of verse 14. Paul tells us his expectation. His expectation is he presses to the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul tells us the reason he's running the Christian race, and that is the prize. That is the award that is presented to the victor in a race. You see, Paul wanted to run a good race, and he wanted to win the prize that God had for him. You see, Paul knew that God chose him for a reason. He knew that God had called him into his service to carry out a duty before God. He knew that successful completion of this goal would allow him to enjoy the rewards of the Lord. And by the way, things today are still the same. Jesus offered you salvation for a reason. He offered you a, re a salvation so that you might live with him in eternity. We go back to the book of John, chapter 14. And I want to read the first six verses of that chapter. John chapter 14 and verse 6. And I want you to pay close attention to the words John records through inspiration. You probably know most of this passage by heart where Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, notice what he says, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. But then Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? And then in verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. When you go back over to our passage in Philippians chapter 3, when you see that Paul presses to the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, what he is telling us is the very simplistic facts that we should have known about the gospel of Jesus Christ. That in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, we have the very first prophecy of Jesus. Then we can turn to the book of Isaiah, and we can read about the coming of the Messiah. Chapter 7 and verse 14 speaks of a virgin birth of a, of a man, and that is fulfilled in the gospel records in Matthew chapter 1, also in other places there in the gospel records. So we know that God had a plan to send Jesus. We know that he sent Jesus. We know that God had a plan for Jesus in this life. And that was that he could go through this life being a perfect example for you, for me. That heaven could be our home. You see, Jesus went to the cruel cross of Calvary to give his life as a ransom for our life. Yes, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from our sin, but the reason Jesus came was to give his life so that we might have life. That was God's plan. Paul says in the book of Galatians that in the fullness of time, God sent his son. You see, Paul understood that the prize was that which Christ offered through the resurrection, and that is to life eternal. Paul knew the rewards of pursuing the Lord.
if we go back over to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we look at verse 8, again, another of Paul's writings, this again, writing to our brethren at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and look at verse 8. Notice he says, Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. The reward you or I receive will be because of what we do for the Lord. Or perhaps we need to go back to the book of Matthew, chapter 25. In the great judgment day scene, there Jesus describes for us, look at verse 21. He said, His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you a ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. There in the parable of the talent, speaking to the five talent and the two talent man, receiving the reward for the work that they had done. Paul had a great expectation of this prize that was before him because of what he had done. That's why Paul could conclude in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, but not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. You notice Paul mentions this prize as a high calling. See, God did not offer us salvation that we might live forever in this world. He offered us salvation so that we can join him in the glory of heaven one day. He saved us so that we might follow him and to be like him in every aspect of of our life. Don't cheapen salvation tonight by running after the flesh, by running after the ways of the world and the evil that exists in this old world. You and I should treat our relationship with God like the precious thing it is by striving to live up to that high calling that he has allowed us to have. And then lastly, verse 15 and verse 16, Paul gives us an exhortation. In those verses, he says, nevertheless, or excuse me, verse 15, Therefore let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if anything, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the, the, the degree we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind. What Paul is simply telling us is, Here's the attitude of the mature Christian. And that is that we will have the mind of Christ. That we will be unified in what he wants from us. You see, the question is, does our attitude match the attitude of Paul? He warns us that if we have a different opinion about how the Christian race should be won then the Lord will deal with us justly according to our thoughts. The only problem that we have, too many people today are enjoying the race they are running. And if God asks them to run a race differently, they won't change. What a sad statement. Paul says we must run this race together. So tonight... If you and I are to succeed in the Christian life and we're to give God the honor and the glory by the lives that we live, then we're going to have to run the race by His way. We have to run with our eyes focused upon Him. We have to learn to turn a blind eye to the allurements of the world and a deaf ear to the song of compromise. You see, if you and I will attain the prize of Christ's likeness, then we'll have to pay the price of dedication and of struggle. It will be a hard-fought victory, but in the end, when we see the glory of God, it will be worth it all. So tonight, or how are you running? What race are you running? Are your eyes focused on Jesus? You see, we sing a song sometimes that says, Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. You see, getting your focus solely on Jesus will give you the direction you need to successfully run the race for his glory 
and for your eternal benefit as you strive for the prize. I hope tonight's study will be beneficial for you. If you have questions or comments, want to study the gospel further and study the Bible, feel free to contact me. My email address is at the beginning of this video and also it will show up here in just a moment after we transition out of the live part to a slide that will give you the church website that has multiple sermons on it. We just encourage you, run a race that will be pleasing to God. May God bless you and remember to be a light in a world of darkness.